We're going to shift to something uh, called identity or understanding your identity. And uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about stolen identity and, and, and just continue uh, moving forward. With, you know, there one thing that's for certain is that uh, our nation it is really wrestling with an identity crisis. And, and I, 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 I really believe that um, that attitude reflects leadership. You know, I believe that our nation struggles with an identity crisis because I believe its leadership struggles with an identity crisis, but not the leadership that you might think. The reality is, is that when God created this earth, he, did, he established one set of people to rule this earth, and that was kingdom people. So I don't necessarily put the blame on anybody that's been voted in office. I don't put the blame on anybody that sits in a high seat and bangs a gavel. I put the blame of the identity struggle on those that God has established to rule and have dominion. That's right. You follow me? And so I, I really want us to understand who we are within the kingdom of God, within this earth, and our rightful place to have, uh, have, have authority, who we are. And just the, the fact that things shape around us based on who you and I are. Just the bottom line. So I'm going to dig into that. We're going to begin reading in Genesis uh, chapter 3. And uh, beginning at verse 1. So let's read there. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Let's pray again really quickly, Father. I, you know, I said a few minutes ago that our nation is in an identity crisis, and, and I believe that. Uh, I believe that, that we have, uh, when you don't know who you are, when you don't know what you possess, when you don't know what you have the ability to walk in, you lose a lot of stuff. Because you don't know what's yours and what's not. Right. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. You don't know what's yours, you don't know what's not. And so it's, it's easy. When you don't know what you have rightful possession of and what you have uh, rightful language to use and who you are and your authority and what God is developing inside of you, and it's, it's easy to allow something to be stolen because you didn't know whether it was ever yours or again. And so this nation, and I say this nation because the reality is it's as much of this world that's really growing and increasing in the faith of, of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. It's happening in leaps and bounds and, and, and numbers. Our media does not produce it because our media does not want you to understand it. The problem is, is that the voice, uh, there's been a voice of increase in our nation uh, that has uh, that has become a voice of influence, and it's much louder than the voice that God has given us. Not because what we possess and the voice that we have is any less powerful, it's that we have lost touch with how powerful it really is and how to produce that voice. You will change the scope of influence in any place, if it's your job, if it's your church, if it's your, your city, if it's your family, I don't care what it is. When you can shift the voice, you can change the influence. You can change the demeanor of, of, of the environment when you can change what voice is in charge. That's something that we've got to reestablish. 
within ourselves and within the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Tanya, I appreciate you playing for me this morning. <clears throat> Tanya does a good job, don't she? Amen. 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 Satan, uh, Satan, to give you an understanding that we have been uh, conditioned and structured to believe that he is all powerful, that he has so much ability, so much strength. So, you know, we sometimes will stare in the face of who the enemy is and become afraid because we see uh, this overbearing and overpowering uh, force that stands against us. And in reality, he's, it's, he's extremely weak unless we give him the authority to work in our life. Amen. So Satan, the only, he cannot operate by God's spirit. Let me establish something right now. is that There is no other force that's more powerful in this universe than the spirit of God. Everything that you step out and see, I, you can look at this building, you can look at those around you right now and realize that everything is here, everything that you have the ability to consume in your eyes and your ears and your nose, your hands and your feet was produced by the Spirit of God. So there's nothing more powerful than His Spirit because everything once was inside of Him. All right? Now, if you have an understanding of that and then have an understanding that you and I were created in God's Spirit, then you realize that when I really have an understanding of my identity and who I am, I know that there is nothing that I face and nothing that stands in front of me that is more powerful than what is inside of me. He said that, you know, he that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. And in some point in time, we have forgotten that, that is, you know, that's the truth and not just a scripture that we produce. Right. Right. At some point, the word has to become something that we understand, not just something that we know. Yeah, that's good. Are you following me? At some point, Scripture has to live and breathe inside of us. God's Word has to live inside of us. And the one thing that makes God's Word transform from just being information to being a living organism is the Spirit of God. Yeah. And so if you want revelation of, of God's truth and God's Word and God's power and the, and the reality that God's Word produces power, then allow the Holy Spirit to invade your life, give you an understanding of who God is and what He's speaking so that that power can be produced through your life. When you gain that understanding, you will realize that your adversary is no match. Yeah, right. Come on. Because the adversary cannot walk in God's spirit. Are you following? He cannot walk in God's spirit. He does not have the ability to produce God's spirit, to operate in God's spirit. And so he does not possess the power that you and I possess. So there's got to be something then that gives him the ability to overcome us. There's got to be something that gives him power over us because he can't operate by God's uh, spirit. So how does he gain control? He gains control through ignorance. Right. Mm -hmm. You following? I'm going to walk down your alley today. You good with that? <clears throat> he walks in our ignorance. He doesn't operate with ignorance. He operates in it. He, he, what he tries to do is, is to get you to a place to where you question anything that God has ever said, anything that you've ever been taught. He tries to get you into a place of doubt. And that little bit of doubt can produce a mountain of doubt inside your mind when God's word is real and you begin to question whether it's even true or not. So he'll operate in the place of ignorance in your life. That's how he begins to gain control is in the dark places of your mind. What he, can, what, can, what he can say, what he can speak, what he can sit on your shoulder and begin to communicate to you. Begin to try to shift your thinking and the words that are being deposited in your, in, in your life. If you listen to it long enough, it will get you to a place of ignorance or doubt in God's word. When you, when you enter into that place is when he has gained control and authority over your life. And he cannot do it by spirit, so he has to do it by ignorance. Are you following now here's what's interesting is we find out a little bit later in chapter 3, that, and we've talked about this in, in the previous weeks, is that God's spirit was deceived from man. It was taken from man by, by the enemy. It was, it was handed over by Eve and by Adam to the enemy. And so the enemy, he knew exactly what he was doing to try to get that spirit out of man because that spirit produces truth. And that spirit is the illumination of understanding and information. And so he said, listen, if I can pull the spirit out of them, not only will I rob them of their power, but I can begin to deposit ignorance in their life that they don't even have an understanding of their own identity. <laughs> so he operates in a place called ignorance. He gains rule over his subjects when he can keep them in the dark about their true nature, their environment, and God's kingdom. Darkness is the absence of light. 
And if light represents truth, then the darkness must represent ignorance. You follow me? So in order to establish man in darkness and wrong and his ignorance, he had to remove the light from him, which is where we see the deceiving of God's spirit from man. Now watch this. In, in, in ignorance is the lack of information or of knowledge. Look at, look at 2 Corinthians really quick. It says, whose minds the God of this age, that's the enemy, has blinded. All right? Who do not believe because there's been doubt through the blindness. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The light of the gospel, the truth, lest the truth. He don't want the truth inside of them. So if he can find a way to deposit ignorance into their life and remove truth or to get them to doubt the truth, then he has rule and reign over you. All right? God even warned us about that. So the ignorance is a lack of knowledge or information. And then when you realize that, then you know that knowledge lies at the balance or the struggle between two kingdoms. All right, Proverbs 1, 7 says this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We see right here, then, the war between evil and good. The war between evil and good is not always fought with swords and spears and, and, and all kind of uh, prayerful language and, and, and fire and brimstone. It's not always, it's sometimes it's fought literally in the place of the transfer of information which is in your mind. Are you following? We see in Proverbs 1 7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge or the beginning of everything, the beginning of understanding of the kingdom and the power of his spirit. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So which are you going to decide to walk in? Are you going to walk in the knowledge of the truth of God? Or are you going to allow something to deposit foolishness in your life? That's where the battle begins to wage war. The enemy is trying to get you to a place where he can literally just speak into your life and deposit untruths, even if he takes the truth and just shifts it a little bit and creates doubt inside of you. He has already begun to win the war that's happening in here. Right. All right? That's good. And so, looking inside of yourself, you can really determine what war am I fighting and which side is winning. Because am I willing to embrace knowledge and truth in my life to where it changes me and shapes me and shapes my thinking and thus my decisions or I'm allowing myself to be ridiculed and cast down and given untrue information by an enemy that's given me a whole different perspective about who I am and about what I have the ability to walk in. All he can do, listen to me, he does not have God's spirit, so all he can do to you is change your mind. All right? If that wasn't the case, then when Jesus came, he wouldn't have said repent, for the kingdom is now here. Because repent means change your mind. That's all it means. In order to embrace me and what I'm trying to do in your life, you've got to have a change of mind. Because at some point in time, you've entered into a place the way your mind was changed. And it's been controlled by the enemy. If you want my spirit in you, then you've got to change your mind again. All right? And begin to walk in a place of truth. So the knowledge lies at the heart of the struggle between two kingdoms. And it's in knowledge where the adversary mounted his original attack. He gets his power from what we don't know or, or, or what we doubt. He, he literally hates the words of God because he has no weapon against them. And so if he can take the words of God and begin to manipulate them and begin to shift them and change them or even dis distribute that seed of doubt the way you even question what God said that he's begun to have access into your life. Now, and this happens all over the place and it happens inside the church. Because it's the church that has revelation of Scripture. Are you following me? But we'll take Scripture and we'll shift it just that much so that it fits my lifestyle or it fits Amen. my ideology instead of me embracing the truth of God and allowing the truth of God to shape my thoughts. We'll take God's Word and the power of the enemy and allow us to shift God's Word to fit us. Amen. And then we look at it and, it and it and it creates a place of what 2 Corinthians said is the blindness because when I'm blind, I do not have the ability to see. And so when I begin to shift God's word, and yet then it is still God's word, but it's got my connotation to it, then I'm blinded to the fact that it's not reality. Right. Are you with me? I'm living in a false positive because I have put my life and given God's stamp of approval on my life of something that he never even said. And then I will use that as my argument to those who are trying to correct me. Are you following? Yep. Come on. You're not making any sense right now. Plenty of sense. And so, if he can get you just to question a little bit about God's words, 
and about God's truth because he has no, he has no ability to, 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 to come against it. He has no ability to overcome it. The Bible, the Bible says that the word is a two-edged sword. And so he has no ability to fight God's word. He knows that in a moment, you can look all throughout Scripture, that any time the word of God was produced, the enemy had to cower. It had to submit. It had to obey. He knows the moment that God's word is spoken, that he has to respond and he has to submit. And so if he can get to a place to where you've got his word convoluted in your mind and all mixed up, he realizes that I don't care if they think they know Scripture. I, what I can deposit in them, if it's doubt when they produce it, I don't have to listen because it's not truth. And so we begin to allow our, our thinking to be shaped about something that's not even the truth of God because doubt has been put inside of us. Or we don't even know what we have the, or the glory behind what we have the ability to produce because we've lost that spirit. And the enemy just sets up camp in our life. So knowledge is the heart. Lies at the heart of the struggle between two kingdoms. I want you to look back at Genesis 3. One through four really quick, and let's look at this. This is the beginning of the onslaught of the enemy. And this, this is where you need to take note at how the enemy operates in your life. Because we often, uh, we often will look for him to come in ways that are disastrous. We'll look for him to show up in ways that literally crumble our life. And it's just, it, it, it's, it's wicked sickness and it's, it's mad issues in our family and our marriages and it's bad financial problems and it just comes in and it looks like this big overwhelming storm that comes in, in, in to take over our life. And the reality is, is that if we've got to that point a lot of times that it's beginning to defeat us, it's because he's already begun to work the war inside of our thought process. But the original place that he'll begin to work to wage a war in your life will happen inside the information that you take in and what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. If that was not the case, then Jesus said, he, you know, or God would have said in John 3, 16, believe. Believe that my son, it, it, you know, died on the cross and gave his life for everybody. It, belief wouldn't have been used. But he, the enemy is going to try to challenge what you believe and it began here in the garden. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And, and that word cunning means crafty. It means he's sneaky. He's subtle. He's working out a way to try to get inside the mind of an individual to produce information. Because he's not coming in the way that you think he's coming with an iron fist. He's not coming with hellfire and brimstone. He's coming quietly and he's trying to deposit untruth in the side of your mind. Because, listen, it's an easy approach for him. He doesn't have to bring the army behind him if he can literally begin to talk into your ears and get you to think something differently about yourself. Because if you begin to think something differently about yourself, then the war is already won and he didn't even have to fight. Right. All he had to do was talk. You follow me? And so he begins to wage war on knowledge. He says, and he said to the woman, look, has God really said this? Did God really say this? Are you sure that this is what God said? Are you positive that that's exactly what you heard God say to you? Are you certain? Can you be sure that he said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the, to the servants the first time, she said, yeah, that's what he said. You, you, you ever been confident about something and somebody keep telling you, are you sure? And all of a sudden you start yeah. questioning yourself. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I don't know. I don't know if that's what I meant or not. I don't know if that's what I heard or not. It's, the, it's doubt. Mm. It's doubt. She said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you ain't going to die. Man, you're God's creation. He loves you too much to kill you. You ain't going to die. He's trying to protect. Don't you remember that he said he had plans for you and he had plans to prosper you and plans not to harm you and plans to give you a future? You think God's going to kill you? He loves you too much for that. God ain't going to kill you. Well, maybe he won't. Maybe, maybe, maybe if I just, you know, maybe he won't. Maybe God, maybe I can, I can shake God's word just a little bit and it ain't going to be that big a deal. You ain't going to die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it. And this is what's interesting. He said, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what Eve uh, uh, began to experience and what the enemy began to do is begin to challenge Eve on who she was. 
He began to challenge her identity because God said, this is who you are. And, 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 and said, you're made in my image, in my likeness. And if you don't believe it, go back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And he said, let us make man in our image to have a dominion and authority and rule and reign everything that their feet tread upon. I'm going to make them like me. And then the enemy looks at her and says, well, you ain't nothing like God because you don't know it all. And if you eat of this, why would he told you not to eat of this tree? Because he knows that when you eat of this tree, that you're going to be just like him and know it all. And she begins to question who she really is to begin with. He plants a seed of doubt in her life that she can begin to question whether God has, anything that God has said from the moment that she was given breath in her body till now was anything even true. Now I'm beginning to reflect whether anything that God has ever said about me is even true. Come on, you ain't been to a place. Uh, you know, somebody's encouraged you in your life, but you're going through hell right now, and you look back on that time in your life where you were encouraged, and you begin to question. I wonder if what they were saying was even true. Yeah, come on now. I wonder if what he was praying over me was even, even anything from God at all, whether it was even accurate. Because I, I, I see who I am right now and what I'm walking in and the decisions that I make, and I wonder the things that were said about me, the encouragement. It was, well, I wonder if that was even true at all. I wonder if God even sent that person to talk to me. I wonder if God even sent that person to pray with me. I don't even know if it's true. I don't even know if God has even done anything in my life to this point. Because it seems like every time I call on him, he ain't never there. Yeah. Is God even real in my life? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the seed of doubt that the enemy began to work in her ignorance. So he attempted to disrupt the knowledge and the understanding that God had already distributed to Adam and Eve. What you've got to understand is what God had done when he said, do not partake of the tree in the center of, of the garden of the, the knowledge of good and evil. He was trying to create order and discipline and protection that would keep them in a place of authority, not grant them more. He had already, here's the thing is that when God made you, he made you in completion. There was nothing lacking in your life. There was nothing else that needed to happen. There was only revelation of yourself that you needed to understand who you were. But when God built you and breathed life into you, he was done and he said it is good. When he built out of an Eve, he said, man, it's done and it is good. I don't have anything else that I need to produce in their life. I have already made them like me. Now watch this. Watch this. He says, listen, eat of that tree and your eyes are going to be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. This is what you've got to understand. Let me ask you, has anybody ever questioned this right here, thinking, well, why didn't God give them the ability to know everything to begin with? If he created them with dominion, why didn't he give them the ability to know everything to begin with? Well, maybe God was really kind of short a little bit. No, no. The understanding of this word knowing, God was trying to protect them from revelation of evil that they did not have to experience. See, God is the omniscient God that knows everything. He has an understanding of everything. Listen, you can, you can be alive and have an understanding of what marriage is, but it's a whole different understanding when you're involved in it. Right. Are you following me? And so God is omniscient and has an understanding of what evil is, but God never had experiential knowledge of it. He had never been evil. And so what the enemy is trying to say here is that, listen, I'm trying to trick you because you think you know that God knows everything. God has not ever operated in evil. He knows what it is. He has an understanding of evil, and he's trying to protect you from it. But when you give yourself over to the lust of the enemy, you involve yourself in a place that God's never been. And then we want to blame God for getting us there. Are you following me? Yeah. We'll blame God. God, why, why did you carry me to this place? And God's like, I didn't carry you there. You carried yourself there. I hear this phrase all the time about, people say something like, you know, well, 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 well everything happens for a reason. I'm going to tell you that's a crock of bull. Because God has a plan, a, a design plan, and a structure and an order plan for your life to keep you disciplined and prosperous. And if you follow that plan, it, it will walk you way away from some things that you find yourself involved in. And so 99% of the things that we get ourselves into is because we got ourselves into it and we're the issue and not God. Amen. God said, I was trying to keep you in a place of protecting you to keep you in authority. I, I had a place, I had things in your life that you never had to experience had you not made a decision to walk in them for yourself.
Doubt creates that ignorance and walks you into things that you had no business being in to begin with. But let, let me tell you how we get to this place is because Eve gave the enemy access with a voice. You have to be careful of the voices that you allow in your life. Yes, now, now listen to me. I know you can sit there and say, well, I can't stop somebody from talking. No, there's a difference in somebody having a mouth and somebody having a voice. Are you following me? And the reality is, is guess who becomes the authority gatekeeper in what is allowed in your life? You are. And so everything that talks don't have no business talking into your life. Everything that's producing sound, you don't have, you don't have a need to listen to. Because it will carry you in some places and drive information into your life that you ain't got no business listening to. And you'll find yourself in revelation of knowledge that you had no business walking in and then try to blame it on God when you made the decision to allow the voice to talk you into it. That's good. True. We've got to know the voices that are producing information in our life. We've got to know the voices that we're giving out. You've got to be careful who you're giving access to because they'll walk you in places that you had no business going. So he worked to minimize the impact of God's voice in order to raise the level of his voice in her life. And, and voices, here's the thing, voices will dictate our perspectives. Yeah. Listen to me. Everything you've learned in your life has come from a voice. Yeah. Are you following? You learned how to make a peanut butter jelly because somebody had a voice. You, all right? You learned how to add two plus two because somebody had a voice. So every piece of information that's been revelation in your life has come because somebody had a voice to teach it to you. So every bit of information that you have comes from a voice. So your perspectives are shaped by the voices in your life. When your perspectives are shifted, it shifts your thinking, and your thinking shifts your decisions. Yes. Yep. Are you following? Yep. And so here's the, now watch this. You have to look back then on the, on, on the mistakes that you have walked in in your life, the places you have found yourself in, the things you, you, you gained information about that you have no, had no business gaining information about, the circumstances you found yourself operating in, the, the, the mistake, the decisions that you, you found yourself living in and having to deal with the consequences of, and you can look back and realize that all of that happened because of a voice that was allowed. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? Everything that has happened in your life has been because of the voices that you've given access. Everything. And so if there's been some things in your life that you're not proud of, if there's some things in your life right now that you're not happy with, if there's some things in your life, some, uh, somebody that you're even being, something you're operating in that you don't even like, maybe you need to reevaluate the voices that are speaking in you. Because it's shaping your thinking and your perspective, which is shaping your choices. And so when we can change the influence in our life, then we can change what our life is producing. All right? Come on, now. I'm teaching you something right now. Y'all just ain't hollering too well. I got any amens in here this morning? Amen. All right, bro. Preach at me. So the enemy is trying to increase the influence of his voice. Although, here's the thing. You have to, have to understand that although the enemy could talk, it did not gain a place in her mind until she gave it the authority to. See, this serpent had a mouth when she was built. Now follow me. I know that. This serpent had a mouth when she was built, which means it had the ability to produce language or it would not have talked. When it began to talk, she was still in a place of authority and dominion. When it began to talk, she was still in rightful order of the kingdom of God. Are you following me? When, when it began to talk, she was still in a place of being in alignment with God and having God's spirit in her life. When it began to talk, man, she still looked like the image of God, but she gave that voice that had the ability to talk while she was still God's image access into her life, and it shifted her whole thing. And so you have to understand that some of the things that are speaking into you, you do not have to give it permission. You have the ability to turn and walk away. You have the ability to tell it no. You have the ability that even though it wants to produce information, you don't have to chew it up and ingest it and allow it to produce nutrients in your life. Yeah. All right? It's your responsibility to grant the access or remove the access for the voices that are speaking to you. It's your responsibility to look at your inner circle, your fab five, whatever you want to call it, and, and determine who do I want in and who do I want out. If I want things in my life to shift, maybe I need to evaluate who I'm running with. Maybe I need to evaluate what I'm listening to. Maybe some of those people are even blood relatives, but they ain't got no business talking.
talking into your life because they've seen you for what you were and not what God says you are. Amen. You need to determine. Here's the thing is I wouldn't give anybody access to deposit seed in my life unless I was confident they had the spirit of God and were listening to him about what he said about me. I don't want somebody giving an opinion about me, about what their opinion is. I'm not here to produce an opinion. I'm here to produce the spirit of God. And so I only want people speaking into my life and listen to him. Come on now, I'm teaching you something. And so I need to obey. One of the, one of the gifts of the spirit is called discernment. Discernment is about being able to understand and divide right spirits. And so I needed to develop a spirit of gift or pray for the spirit of gift of discernment in my life so that when somebody's trying to talk to me, I can make a decision. Is this God or is it not? Yes. And if it ain't, guess what? You ain't welcome in my house. Amen. Come on now. Come on. You can turn your news feed off on Facebook every now and then. All right? You can cancel getting private messages when people want to talk junk in your life. If you're sick of hearing about racism and flags and everything, turn it off then. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. None of that business has got anything that says who I am in the kingdom Lord. of God. I don't care what yes. flag flies. I don't care what flag falls. I don't care what Amen. color I am. Amen. You are. All that matters to me is that the kingdom of God is the The only reason that I look at somebody else and see that they're a different, oh Jesus. The only reason I look at somebody else and see that they're a different pigment of skin than I am is because somebody told me that. Because God didn't teach me that. God didn't divide me from my fellow man. He built me helpmates. We're to help each other. We're to be a body of Christ. We're to enter into this thing, work in the kingdom, and moving the kingdom forward as brothers and sisters in the army of God. I don't care what color you are because somebody else told me that to produce division in our lives. That makes no difference to me. But I'm, I'm serious. What difference does it make what flag flies and what flag falls? Who cares? All that I care is that the better of God is living in my life. Yes. It makes, that doesn't determine who I am. That doesn't determine who you are. That's right. What happened 80 years ago does not determine who you are. What happened 200 years ago does not determine who you are. What was signed in the Declaration of Independence of this country does not determine who you are. Why in the world are you going to allow the colony to develop the kingdom inside of you? Why not let the kingdom develop the kingdom inside of you and then begin to save the colony to the kingdom? You follow me? If not, oh, you got to hear this. If I choose to involve myself in the affairs of the colony, I'll never be king. Come on, Come on. Because I have not been, I have not been sent. All right, to be a representation of the colony. I have been sent to be a representation of the kingdom, which means that it sh I should be shaping my environment rather than my environment shaping Lord. me. And if I'm not shaping my environment, then I would question whether you're a citizen of this world or whether you're a citizen of that. All right? Let's go. So I change what's going in. You follow me? Change what's going in. Here's what I would look at. I would look at my black brothers and sisters or my white brothers and sisters or my Hispanic or my Asian and I would look at them and I would say, who told you that you were black? <laughs> who told you that you were white? Are you following me? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in verse 11 he said, who told you that you were naked? Come on, man. Mm. Come on. I didn't tell you that. I don't see anywhere inside of scripture that gives me a division of race. Right. It gives me a division of language, but it never gives me a division of race. Right. Come on now. Yeah. See, we were sent with what bloodline? Are you following it? Yeah. I'm way off this thing. Yeah. 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 We were sent with one bloodline. And the bloodline that's on the inside matters and the bloodline that's on the outside. See? And so you need to forget what grandma and granddaddy said. You need to start listening to what the king said. Because it ain't grandma and granddaddy's blood living inside of you. And it's not their breath in your body. It's the king of all kings. So I'm going to listen to what he says. And if he don't like racism, I don't either. That's right. Well. You follow me? I need to know the order of God. And I don't care what everybody else says. Matter of fact, it's only used to distract my time from productivity. So many people have spent so much time in the last two weeks and giving their opinion on Facebook, spending time on media, spending time watching the news, spending time giving their, their course of opinions. What difference does it make? Because it's keeping you from doing what God sent you to do. How have we produced anything the first
further the kingdom by being distracted by the vision. But it came in quietly. It came in as a cunning servant. Subtle. Not blazing guns. We ain't having a civil war. You follow me? We having a verbal war based off information. That information had to be shifted by somebody. Are you, are you following me? Yeah. Here, here's the thing. Uh, let, let me just say this and I'll get off of it. Two, two three weeks ago, whenever it was, we had a complete tragedy in our, in our state. Mm -hmm. But our state handled it with dignity, pride, right. and understanding. Yes. Yes. When different voices begin to invade our territory, yes. is when the scope of our territory shifted. Yes. And we allow them in. Are you following me? I don't care who they were. I don't care if they were black, white, from this organization or this media outlet. I don't make a difference. They were not happy with the fact that we stood in unity together because it wants to create a spirit of division. Right. Whether you realize it or not, man, the spirit that's operating our nation and our world is a spirit of division and not unity. But that voice and that spirit has got to change, and we've got to be the ones to do it. Right. Oh, man. All right. I'm trying. <laughs> so the enemy is trying to increase his influence of his voice and she grants him that promotion so I say again what voices are you promoting in your life and unless God gives the promotion it's not a promotion worth having right. Right. voices again will shift your thinking and they will determine your decisions now watch go to verse Six and seven really quickly. <clears throat> so when the woman saw, now watch this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, not in God's wisdom, but in revelation of the God of this earth. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. <clears throat> Ain't everybody around you trying to hand you something productive for your life. <laughs> they may look like your husband. They may look like your wife. They may look like your co-worker and your boss. They may look like your mom or your dad. They may look like they're inviting company, but the reality is, is they're in it for selfish gain. Are you following me? They don't have your best interests at heart. Because the spirit has shifted. Now watch this. In the, same, Jesus. in the same household, in the same household, we now have one living by the spirit and one in anger. Are you following me? See, she's already partaken of the fruit and disobeyed God. And the spirit has been deceived from her, but Adam has not yet obeyed that voice. But because that's a voice of comfort, a voice of companionship, a voice he's allowed in, a voice he shared his bed, his time, his emotions, and his energy with, he believes now it's a safe voice rather than listening to God and allowing the spirit of the servant to operate in his life to determine, is this from God or is it not? But because I've allowed this voice in, and maybe this voice was good for my past, it ain't good for where you're going. And so the voices that maybe you had to elevate you to a place in your yesterday are not still in your corner. Some of them you need to remove because you allow them in out of comfort. Yeah, that's right. And she said, she, she handed it to him and he, he ate it with her. And his whole world changed. Can you think about the times in your life that you had influences around you that in a moment your whole world changed? Yeah. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew. Now this is this is where this is where it is. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Mm. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. So humanity began to operate into a world of revelation that they were never intended to experience. See, so your decision making and obedience will determine what you face tomorrow. The decisions that you're sowing for today will determine what you wake up to. The decisions that you begin to make today off of impulse and off of comfort and off of uh, you know, erratic voices. Decisions that you're making because you're not seeking God's decisions for your life. You will face those decisions tomorrow. You follow me? And it could change your world. 
And so in a moment, they make a decision that says, well, you know, I think I like what I see. I think I like how it's going to make me feel. I think I like the fact, man, that I might, it might promote me. Are you following me? And so I believe I'm going to partake of it. I'm going to involve myself in it. And God never gave it okay. And so they took the fruit and ate. And then in that moment, it says that their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. Man, God give you the ability to communicate this. <clears throat> there is power in the life and death in the tongue. Right? Didn't you know what the word says? Amen. So our earth was created and given an identity by a voice, and then the identity of our environment was created by a voice. So everything that you see. What you will wake up to on Monday and what you will have to face on Monday and what you will have to face on Tuesday and what you will have to face on Wednesday, regardless of whether it's good or whether it's bad, began with a voice. All right? It began with a voice. It began with, with, with access and influence. And so their eyes were open and then they were naked. Now, this is what the enemy was really trying to get to. And what he was working through in verses 1 through 4, where he was trying to plant seeds of doubt into God's instruction. If I can begin to doubt God's instruction, if I can begin to doubt, now watch, if I can begin to doubt what God is telling me to do, and I doubt that whether what God is even saying to me is even right or accurate, then maybe I'll begin to backtrack and determine whether God said anything to begin with was right. So if maybe God's instructions to me, if I begin to doubt that, then maybe I, I begin to doubt what God said about me. you got to see what he's building. He planted a seed of doubt to question God's instructions and so that God's voice would be diminished and his voice would be increased. And we go even back to the place of creation to where God named Eve and said who she was. See, he wasn't, he wasn't just interested in just trying to change uh, their obedience to instruction. He was trying to get to a place that he could reshape their identity. Are you following me? If you know who you are, I, I will say this to them, the day I die. If you know who you are and who God has built you to be, there is nothing that can conquer you. There is nothing that can overcome you. The enemy understands that and is more afraid of your identity, and so he's trying to shift it. If he can change the way you view yourself, then he can disrupt your whole world and begin to operate in a place that he don't even have to throw spears. He can just cause you to talk bad about who you are. Yeah. He can cause you to produce wrong information. Now watch this. If your identity is disrupted, then everything that you touch is disrupted. If God has sent you to a place to change the scope of your environment, the relationships that you have at your job, the way your family functions. And, and if he's been sent you to create order and righteousness in your life and those around you, the one moment that you break out of a place of understanding your identity, you have just disrupted the identity of your environment. Are you following that? Do we not pay now for a shift of identity 6,000 years ago? Did you eat the apple or the fruit? I didn't either. I've done some stuff I ain't proud of, but I didn't do that. Right? But because she allowed her identity to be shifted, it changed mine. So we have to be cautious then of what we're listening to and what we're believing and what we're producing. Because he got to a place and he began to try to shift her thought processes about herself. See, the nature of something is determined by the one that gives it its definition. Okay? The name, listen, God created this earth. He said the ocean is going to move like this, and the sun is going to move like this, and all the planets are going to move like this, and the earth is going to rotate like this, and it's going to cool in this part of the day, and it's going to heat in this part of the day, and this is how it's all going to operate, and I'm the one giving this definition because I'm its creator. And then he said, Adam and Eve, I'm making you in my image, all right? And I'm giving you the ability to determine in things definition. You name the animals and you give them their function and you operate by my power and my authority to understand how my voice works and you give on earth definition just as I gave in the heavens definition. So the nature of something is determined by the one that creates this definition. You follow me? Stay with me for a minute. And here's the problem. In verse 7 it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they 
We're naked. Mm -hmm. And then we, 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 jump, we jump down to verse 11 and he said, who told you that you were naked? Because I didn't. Who, who gave you this new identity because it's not the one I gave you? Who have you allowed to reshape the thinking of yourself because it's not the way I taught you to think? Who allows you to see yourself in a different light because that's not the way I see you? Who, 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 who have you given access to that has begun to shape your information about yourself? See, I built you and I never called you naked. I called you king. Mm, my Lord. See, when I built you and produced you, I called you in my likeness. I didn't call you naked. Naked was something that you had revelation of when you walked in an area of your life that I had never intended for you to walk in. So you get in some things in your life that you had no business going and it gives you a different perspective about who you are. You get involved with some things you had no business getting involved in and you step back and say, well, I don't even know if I'm a good person or not. I don't even know if I got Jesus living in me or not. How did I do that and I got Jesus living in me? How, how, did, I, how did I just, how, yeah, come on now. You ain't left the club, slap, drunk, and be like, man, I'm supposed to have God living. How do I even do that? Amen. That ain't even me. How can, that, how, can, how can my pastor look at me and say, you are the creation and the image of God, but yet I'm walking out of the strip club right now? Yeah, right. How, how, how is that even me? My Lord. How, how in the world am I sitting here having an argument with my, my wife and pushing her down on the couch and yet my, my pastor and, and my pastoral care team is praying over me and telling me how powerful a man of God I am? Because God never looked at you and said, that's who you are. Yes, Jesus. He said, I built you as a king. Yeah. I made you in my likeness. And my likeness is good. I'm, you should be proud of who you are because you were built like me. And Jesus. when he began to shift their identity, when they began to think differently about themselves, when they saw something about themselves that God never said they were, guess what they did? They ran and tried to hide who God made them. Because they were confronted by the presence of God. They had to look in the mirror. God decided to take a walk and walk by with a mirror. He said, listen, I've made you in my image, but I'm coming by with a mirror. And they had to stand and look in the mirror and say, oh, something's changed about my life. I don't look like that anymore, and so i got to hide from who I really am. Come on, I'm talking to you right now. See, when you get in your place of shame and frustration and doubt and guilt in your life and then you want to run and hide from God, the reality is, is that the enemy is playing tricks with your mind because you're not hiding from who you are now. You're hiding from who you used to be. Oh, Lord. Come Listen, the things of your life, your sin, your frustration, your pain, the situations you've walked through, your circumstances, they're not who you are. They're not the essence of what you're made up to be. They're a covering over your life. And the covering can be removed just like a veil was when the master entered into the Holy of Holies and ripped it wide open to enter it back into the presence of God. So the, here's the thing is they had a different picture about their definition and nothing changed about their body. Was their body in the nude when they were given life? See, nothing, oh, gee, y'all got to, you got to get this. Nothing changed about their physical environment, but because everything changed inside of their inner environment, their whole picture changed of their environment they lived in. Right, right. Oh. <laughs> they went and made themselves coverings. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. I'm just going to show you now, right? Let me tell you something. It's time that we quit hiding. Mm -hmm. It's time that we quit hiding. It's time that we quit hiding as individuals because you do not need to be ashamed of who you are. You do not need to be ashamed of what God spoke into your life. I, it, it makes no difference what went on yesterday. It makes no difference what happened last week. Let me tell you something. One of the traps of the enemy is to get you recollecting in your mind over and over and over again the abuse you were dealt when you were five. Come on now. Because if he can get your mind settled on what happened when you were five, you'll never understand who you were when you were given life. If, if in my life, my mind can be veiled from the circumstances that have happened from beginning until now, I'll never see the point that God spoke to me and gave me a rebirthing in my life and told me who I was. Right, 
I always see myself or what the enemy wants me to see. So every bottle you've ever turned up and every dollar you've ever made rain and every needle you've ever put in your arm and everything that you've ever acted in unnatural relationships and out of, out of wedlock and all these things, that is not your definition. That's something that you walk in. You cannot be redefined unless you allow it. Are you following me? You cannot be redefined unless you give access to that voice. Quit allowing things to define you that don't even know you. Quit allowing things to wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you who you are and what you're going through and they don't even have a clue what God made in you. What voice are you going to give access to in your life? Because if you continue to wake up defeated, then I can tell you what voice you're listening to. If you can continue to question what God is trying to develop in you, I can tell you what voice you're hearing. I can tell you what voice you've laid and given permission to. But that's your authority. Everything around you, everything you've ever gone through, determine who you are when it was never given that power by God. It wasn't but one agent that God said, I'm making in my image, in my likeness, and I'm giving my voice, and that's you. Come on, let's stand up for this. Quit allowing yourself to be defined. 